We'd like to welcome you to uh, First Baptist Church of Kernville. Those of you watching on Facebook, those of you listening on 99.7 KFBC, your station for acoustic Christian worship and quality biblical preaching. And we're uh, just thankful that you're here with us in whatever way that you can be. We want to wish everyone a happy Mother's Day, particularly the mothers, but this is one of those holidays that really uh, you either are a mother or you had one, so we can all celebrate mothers and, and what they've done for us. And uh, so first and foremost, as the Church of Jesus Christ, not of Latter-day Saints, but just the Church of Jesus Christ, we are here to, to worship the one who has done more for us than anyone. He has created us, he has given us life, and he has also given us eternal life. And so we're here to begin our service by singing about his, his beauty, his grace, his goodness to us, and his unfailing love that has allowed us to be a part of his body and to be a part of the kingdom of God. And so if you would join with me in singing um, Beautiful One. Before we do that, I want to also remind you that the uh, lyrics for the songs are available on our Facebook page, so you can print those out. Also, the sermon notes are there, so if you haven't done that yet, um, you can do that at this time. And so if you would, join me in singing Beautiful One.
come today to do just that, to worship your holy name, to worship you in song, pray that you would help us to, to learn what you would have us to learn, to learn about the, your nature, your goodness, your holiness, your righteousness, your love, and to, um, as we learn and grow in the grace of Jesus Christ, that we would... Uh, just to grow in our faith and our love for you and our love for other people. And we just pray that you would fill Ben with your spirit now as he comes to share the word. We pray that you would be here with us um, wherever it is that we may be and that you would be instructing our hearts through your Holy Spirit and applying the word to our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, I want to start by wishing a happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers that are out there. this country owes on that credit card is $8,398. There are 189 million people who have credit cards in America. The U.S. average for mortgage debt is $192,000. In California, that debt is $335,000. In 2017, no sound? In 2017, we lose our sound. Is it on, on Facebook? Do we have Facebook sound yet? Let's check this. We have a, a brief blip here.
we're getting we're getting sound off of the camera, but we're not getting sound. We're good. It's coming through. Yeah. Okay. You got my blip comment there, so we should be we should be all right there. Sorry, we're uh, experiencing some technical difficulties here. So, uh, if you missed that, we have a lot of debt, right? Thirteen point eight six trillion to creditors, eight thousand dollars for everybody on their credit cards. In two thousand seventeen, the average student debt was thirty seven thousand dollars per student. Nationwide student debt is $1.4 trillion. So let those figures sink in for just a minute. What we get from that is that in order to live how we live and in order to have the things that we have, Americans are nearly $14 trillion in debt. That doesn't even include the federal debt, which is $25 trillion and growing. And so it's a bit of an understatement to say that we owe a lot to a lot of people as Americans. Now, there are some who are listening right now or who are watching right now, and you're saying to yourselves, but I'm a follower of Dave Ramsey, and I don't have any debt. I'm an acolyte of Dave Ramsey in his wonderful way. But the truth is that, that all of us have a debt. And the reason is because every one of us growing up had this supporting cast from birth that was investing in us, who served us, loved us, taught us, nurtured us, challenged us, and trained us so that we would become who we are. Now, this cast includes teachers, it includes ministers, it includes friends, it includes siblings, but probably the most important characters in that supporting cast were our mothers and our fathers. They were our parents, whether we're talking biological, adopted, or other. These are the figures in our lives. Our parental figures invested a lot in getting us where we are, emotionally, physically, spiritually, and financially. The USDA did a study in 2017, and according to their study, it costs around $233,610 to raise a child from birth to the age of 18. Now listen. None of our mothers were or are perfect, but many of them selflessly gave of their lives, gave of their time and of their energy and everything else to train and nurture and love the children that God gave them. And none of us got where we were without the investment of somebody pouring into us. We are all indebted to someone. And because of this, God instructed his people, we're talking both in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 16, and in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 through 3, he says to honor your father and your mother. That is God's command for us. And honor is the currency with which we repay the investment made in us. Let's say that again. Honor is the currency with which we repay the investment made in us. So this is said to be the first command with a promise, right? That God blesses those who honor their father and mother because it's pleasing to him. And so on this Mother's Day, we want to honor Christ by honoring our mothers. And today we're going to explore what that means to honor our mothers. If you are a mother, if you have a mother, if you are married to someone who is a mother, if you occupy a mothering role in discipleship for somebody else, all of this is for you. This pertains to you. And so that pretty much, as Rick said at the beginning, catches every one of us, right? This is pertinent for all of us. Now, this morning, we're going to primarily be in the book of Proverbs. We're going to be in Proverbs 6, Proverbs 1, Proverbs 23. So we're going to be in these various places this morning. And we're going to explore what it means to honor our mothers, not just for one day, but to honor our mothers continually so that we are walking in obedience to God's command for us. Now, I realize that pretty much no parent is out there holding their hand out, saying to their children, you owe me $233,000. Now, there might be some terrible parents out there that are doing this with their kids, but most parents are not asking for that money back. And most parents don't realistically expect that they're going to be repaid. But what we're talking about is repaying this debt of gratitude, this debt with, with honor. In 1 Timothy 5.4, it talks about uh, a return for parents who have, have poured into their children and that's ultimately what we are talking about, repaying the debt as a way of expressing love 
for those who nurtured and cared for us. So we're going to start in Proverbs chapter 6. If you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to Proverbs 6, and we're going to read verses 20 through 23. And this is what it says. It says, My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching a light, and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. So three points this morning, three things that we want to say about honoring. The first is this. We pay our debt when we hold to our mother's instruction. So if you're writing in your, in your outline there, we pay our debt when we hold to our mother's instruction. Proverbs chapter 6, 20 through 21, give us a quick snapshot of what the family unit is meant to look like according to God's way and God's design. There's clearly this mutuality implied where the, the parent pours into the child, the child submits to the parent, and you see here that as God intended, the father carries this unique authority and strength that God has given him to lead. He says, my son, keep your father's commandment. He's in this position. And then the mother, who's generally the primary caregiver in the home, though we can't always assume that anymore, she instructs her children day in and day out, pouring into them. It says, keep your father's command and forsake not your mother's teaching. She's pouring what she's learned into her kids. And this is something that we need to understand, is that, that children are uniquely shaped, for good or for bad, by the influence of their mother. And that puts this... this, this responsibility, this huge responsibility on mothers to always be teachable and to be learning so that there is a wellspring from which they draw in order to water and feed and nourish their children. One of the most cherished memories I have as a child is coming downstairs some mornings and finding my mom sitting in a chair reading her Bible or with the Bible on her lap praying or her kneeling down by the chair with the Bible in front of her praying or, or crying as she's praying. And like th this made an impact on me. And what this did was this lent this in incredible weight when she spoke. Because all of us, her children, understood that when she was speaking and giving instruction, it wasn't just mom's opinions on things. She was coming from the word of God. She was coming from a position of learning and a position of prayer, investing in her children. Now, many who grew up to love the Lord bear this same testimony. I am who I am because a godly mother poured into me that she was focused on following the Lord and she poured into my life. Many more who didn't have this look back and say, I really wish I'd had that. Or they would say, I want to be that for the kids that God has given to me. As a pastor and a husband, it always encourages my heart every morning when I hear my wife's phone ding. And, and what that means is that her accountability partner is sending her the report that she's read her scripture, she's, she's read the word this morning, and then my wife uh, always responds with the same thing, that she has also read these things. And so every morning, these two are keeping one another accountable. Every morning, they're, they're reading the word, and every morning, they're drawing from this well so that they have what they need to nourish their children and face the challenges of the day. As a pastor and as a husband, that encourages me to know that this is what my wife is doing. I know that in this church, and I know that among those who are listening today, that many of you mothers have invested yourselves in the word every day so that you would have the strength and the knowledge and the depth to, to deal with your children, to feed them, and to feed those who look to you for instruction. That's how God has designed this to be. So we honor our mothers by not forsaking what they've taught us, what, what they've mined from daily digging into God's word. And so in Proverbs 6 and in Proverbs 1, we, we're told don't forsake, but instead, and this is the first sub point here, hold them tight so they protect you. These teachings, we're supposed to hold them so that they protect us. The context of Proverbs chapter 6 verses 20 through 29 is, is the admonition to flee the adulteress. Solomon admonishes a young man here to, to listen to the command of his father and, and, and hold the teaching of his mother so that he doesn't get drawn into relationships with those who would lead him into sin. And the way that he does this is through the command of the father. And the way that he does this is through the teaching of the mother. Verses 22 through 23 explain what these things do. It says, when you walk, they, that's the commandment and the teaching, when you walk, 
They will lead you. And when you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you are awake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light. And the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. They protect you. They lead you. They continue to talk with you. They, they illuminate the path of life for you. When we're kids, we don't get this, right? Like when I was a kid, I felt like when I was young, I felt like my parents knew everything. That's kind of the default mode. Parents know everything. But then as you begin to gain knowledge as a kid, you begin to start questioning what they know. You know, when I was about 16 years old, like I went from my parents know everything to at 16 years old, my parents know nothing. The older I got, it felt like the dumber they got. And it felt like, you know, I was the one who was in possession of all knowledge and, and they were not even playing with a full deck. But then this interesting thing happened. What happened was I grew up and I left home and I got married and I started paying bills and I started having adult responsibilities. And then I had kids and I started having to deal with these kids. And then in comparison, I realized that compared to me, my parents were like scholars and sages and I knew nothing. And so at that point where I began to grow up, I started to frantically try to remember what they taught me. And I, and I tried to sort of covertly get advice from them when I would talk to them. And I began to take seriously the things that they taught me because I realized how life-giving it was and how instructive it was. God gave us mothers to protect us. And one of the key ways that they protect us is by teaching us. And we, we live in a world now where there's a lot of mothers that call themselves mama bear and they're always wanting to fight people and they're always wanting to, to get in everybody's face because, uh, because somebody's messing with their kids. But listen, like that's not the primary way mothers are called to protect their children. That's the primary way mother bears are called to protect their children. But mother humans are called to protect their children by pouring instruction and teaching into us. They teach us uh, the dangers of bad company. They teach us the consequences of our decisions. They teach us not to run with things in our mouth. They teach us not to run our mouths. They teach us right and wrong. And sometimes all of this instruction, it just, it seems tedious. But in retrospect, we can look back and see that the mother's instruction is life-giving. Solomon says, don't reject or forsake this. Don't ignore it. Cling to it for it's for your good. And if we don't cling to it, we put ourselves in a precarious position. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 17 says this, The eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. And that's a gruesome imagery, right? The one that ignores a mother's instruction is going to have his eye plucked out by the raven and be eaten by the vulture. Now, that's not literal. It's not every disobedient child or we'd have a bunch of one-eyed or no-eyed children in this world because there's a lot of kids that don't respect their mother's teaching. But what it means is ruin will come to them. Look around the country today. Look at these kids that just disrespect their parents and disrespect their mothers and ignore their teaching. And watch the direction of their lives. You will see that this proverb is true, that they're on their way to ruin. So this is what he says right here. Hold them tight so that they protect you. Flip back to Proverbs chapter 1. And in Proverbs chapter 1, we see a lot of the, the same ideas here, but with a different emphasis. Not only hold fast, but value them as they mold you. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 says this. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. Right? Same idea there. For they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. He goes on, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. And he's giving instruction that keeps this kid from siding with people who are going to lead them to destruction. So this is what we're told here. In this verse, you get this imagery, but instead of a command, you get an explanation. You want to bind these things on. You want to receive them, not only because they're protective, but you want to receive them because they're fashionable as well, because they bring about beauty. They're like a beautiful garland. You'll go to a wedding sometimes, and you'll see the bridesmaids, or you'll see the bride wearing this, this garland, this, this wreath of flowers on their head, and it's this beautiful, delicate thing, and he compares it here to a pendant for your neck, for jewelry. 
Something, something beautiful here. Imagine a gold chain, not like what those huge ones like rappers wear, but this, this very beautiful gold chain, and on it is this pendant, just thing of beauty. I, I'm a fan of the Lord of the Rings, and so the other day we were watching these movies, and the, the character Aragorn, he had this beautiful necklace with this, this elven pendant on it, and that's what I imagine in my mind when I read this passage, this thing of, of beauty, and what he's conveying is the instructions we see, receive, they not only protect us, but they shape us, and they form us, And they implant in us virtue and they implant in us discipline and good habits. And it brings about the development of lovely character. And that's what's going on here in verses 8 and 9. Take these things and develop this character so that when these people come and entice you to walk in the ways of ungodliness, you're prepared to stand against that. Preparing this child to spurn these corrupting influences. Verse 13, these people say, we shall find all precious goods. Notice the difference here. They're talking about things that they can steal and take as precious goods versus the precious goods of this instruction and this character here. And we'll fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us so that we will have one purse. But what it tells us about these people, verse 17, is in vain they... The, In vain is the net spread in the sight of any bird, but these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who's greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. There's a stark contrast being made in this proverb when it comes to value. Instead of treasuring worldly things or the ill-gotten gain of those who are around you, those who receive and hold to the instruction of their mother, they treasure that instruction because they know that it keeps them from following these people that are running fast to their own doom. Again, look at the kids around us. How many kids are are ignoring their mother's instruction and aligning themselves with people who are just leading them to their own destruction? This is, this is the story of 21st century America. But this instruction here, this is forming you to have a proper estimation of values and ethics. And, and Solomon compares it to jewelry and ornamentation because it's a beautiful thing when a child receives this instruction, listens to it, and walks in the path of that instruction. So consider what a treasure it is to have a mother or a grandmother or some other figure that came alongside you and and is still there pouring this important investment into your lives. And for all the mothers and grandmothers and those who are raising children who are living in that time of frustration right now, keep pressing on because you are one of the most important tools that the Lord uses for the development of character in your children. One of the most important tools that God uses to sculpt children into godly adults. Your teaching is arming them for the world, and you're molding and shaping them to live life well. That's what this instruction is for. So for those who have received this, we repay the debt when we hold and treasure this investment, and we don't treat it with contempt. There's nothing that encourages a mother more than seeing that her instruction was kept, seeing the fruit of her investment, seeing her children willing to listen and take those things. Like as a, as a youth pastor, the, the frustration was always that you, you pour into these children and, and you don't get to see the result until years later. The same is true of parenting. And what, a, what an incredible gift that we can give to our mothers something that doesn't decay, something that doesn't fall apart by validating the investment that they made in us. So the first point is this. Point is this. We pay our debt when we hold to our mother's instruction. The second admonition comes from Proverbs 23. So if you've got your Bibles again, turn to Proverbs 23, and we're going to read just verse 22. Verse 22 says this, listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. The second way that we pay the debt is we pay the debt when we undertake her care. So write that in the blanks there, when we undertake her care. In verse 22, that word despise, it means to show contempt for or disrespect her. And it's augmented with this phrase, when she's old. Now a case could be made that this applies to both parents. But there's a unique way in which this applies to to the mother, right? The specific time application and and the practical reason to single out mom, especially in this modern context. Here's some statistics for us to chew on today. In the USA, the life expectancy for a man is 76.4 years. 
the life expectancy for a woman is 82.1 years. Now, 2020 may have changed this. This is 2019 statistics. 2020, everything's going haywire. So it may be 35 now with the life expectancy. But statistically, 76.4 for men, 81.1 for women. You know what that means? That means that guys, no matter how hard we try to be there for our wives, for our mothers, for these women in our lives, the chance, chance is that we are probably going to die before they do. Because statistically speaking, men live shorter lives. They, they have a shorter life expectancy than women. Now, we'd like to think that this is because we work so hard to provide for them, but in truth, it's because we don't read instructions, it's because we don't listen to anyone, and when we get on ladders, we get on that top step that very clearly says, don't stand on this top step. We stack ladders on top of things, we put ladders on forklifts, and we, just, we do all kinds of crazy stuff. That's why we die sooner. I, I'm convinced of that. But as a society, we once accepted the truth that at some point, we were probably going to have to take care of the ones who took care of us. Like, we, we've known this as a society. We've seen this. Tragically, though, it seems that it's becoming increasingly common due to things like our busyness, due to our mobility, for, for grown children to just pat our mother on the head and send her off to a, a nursing home, or send her off to a care facility and let somebody else take care of her because otherwise it's going to mess up the rhythms of our lives. So this is the first sub point here. God has called us to one day care for our parents. God has called us to one day care for our parents. Now, Listen, our, our moms don't always make this easy because they, they like to say things like, oh, I don't want to be a bother. Oh, I don't want to be in the way. And, and oh, I'm just fine. And they tell us things like this. But the truth is that at some point, they're probably going to need our care. Maybe it's our father and our mother. Maybe it's just our mother. And we need to be there for them. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, Paul's giving instruction on how the church ought to deal with widows. And this is what he says. He says, honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has grandchildren or children, children or grandchildren, let them first show or learn to show godliness to their own household and make some return to their parents. That's this idea of paying the debt, right? That they get some return for the investment that they made. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. If you go further to verse 8, it says this. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now listen to that accusation. He's denied the faith. He's worse than an unbeliever. The reason is because he's denied this fundamental, foundational element of the gospel of love. You know, this morning as I was doing my devotionals, it was, it was that Jesus was being asked, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then the second is likened to it, love your neighbor as yourself. Love those around you as yourself. Fundamental gospel truth is that, that our life is all about love. Love for God, love for others. Jesus says that the whole law and prophets are summed up in this. And so we ought to be loving our parents enough to care for them. This is serious business. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 3 through 9, Jesus lights up the Pharisees because they, they enact this system whereby if a child doesn't want to have to take care of their parents, they could, they could proclaim that their goods were korban. And what that means is dedicated to the Lord. And so if a child didn't want to have to take care of their aging parents, what they would do is they would declare their goods dedicated to the Lord. And then when the parents came along, they could say, sorry, there's nothing I can do. My goods are dedicated to the Lord. And once I pass on, all of this has to go back to God or go back to the temple. And Jesus was incensed by this because they were sugarcoating disobedience to God in his law and, and pretending that it was, it was for God and for the glory of God. That would be like somebody saying to their aging parents, I'm sorry, I, I can't take you in. I'm sorry, I can't help you because I tithe and I don't have anything extra in order to, to provide for your needs. Like pretending that our dedication to the Lord is the reason that we can't do the thing that he commanded for us to do. God takes this seriously, the care of our parents. And that's one of the reasons why this ends up in God's top 10 list, right? Number five. The first four uh, instructions in the Ten Commandments are about loving God. The next six are about loving others. And the first one is honor your father and your mother. Now, don't mishear me here. I'm not 
I'm not universally applying nefarious motives uh, or, or self selfishness to to any kid that doesn't care for that doesn't care for their their parent or or uh, sorry somebody's talking out here and it's distracting me. No, it's you. Yeah, <laughs> applying nefarious motives or selfish intent to putting loved ones in a care facility. That's not that's not what I'm saying. You know, there there are times where that's absolutely necessary. There are times where where children can't take care of their parents. Sometimes when it comes to dementia and Alzheimer's, things progress to the point that they can't like have them in their home. But we've all seen children who honor their parents by bending over backwards to find a loving care facility and find a, a place where they can go and visit them all the time and honor them all the time and show that they, they, they cherish them. This is the second sub point. Different contexts may require differing care. There are times where this is necessary. So no judgment from me where circumstances dictate this. Care looks different in different contexts. But to simply pass off the care of our parents like a hot potato in order to, to pass off the care of our parents to somebody else just because we don't want to interrupt the rhythms of life, that shows contempt. And that's what the proverb is decrying here. When it says, do not despise your mother when she is old. Our mothers are not burdens. They're not a bother. They're God's, they're God's instrument and God's tool for our care and for our instruction and our nurture. And there may come a time where they need some of that back from us. When my mom's parents were nearing the end of their lives, I got to see this happening in real life. I saw my parents, my mom especially, because my dad was still working at the time, driving up and down from northern Alabama back home all the time to care for her parents. And then when her father, my grandfather, died, she upped her game and she brought my grandmother into our home and cared for her there. Now, there were inconveniences in this, some more radical than others, but my mom never acted like it was an inconvenience to have her mother there. She never acted like it was, it was putting her or any of us out because she showed what true love and care looks for. And that's been a great example for us, for me and my siblings. And my hope is that at some point in the future, if my mom and my dad or, or one of them needs care, that we, the four of us, are able to, to give that kind of love and care for them as they near the end. We honor our mother's we cherish our mothers when instead of seeing them as a burden or a carpet to walk on, we care for them and we give back to them as they have need, however that looks. My encouragement to each and every one of you, though, is not to wait. Not to wait until the time where they're absolutely in need, but start showing care and start, start showing concern for them, even now, so that when that time comes, you're already in the habit and you're already in practice. Make the choice so that it becomes a lifestyle for this is pleasing to God. I want you to consider the example of Christ as he came to the end of his life. He's nailed to a cross, and there on the cross, he looks down to John, the apostle, and he says to John, behold your mother, and he looks to his mother, and he says, behold your son. And even in death, even as, as life is ebbing out of Christ and as he's leaving this world, he's still concerned with honoring this command to honor your father and your mother. You know, Mary had other children other than Jesus, but yet he ensures that his mother is cared for by somebody who believes. The other brothers, at this point, they still didn't believe in Christ. And so he ensures that she is taken care of by somebody who loves her, somebody that will believe, somebody that follows after Christ. And so he shows us this example in his own life of what it means to care for our mothers. So, first of all, hold to the instruction. Like, even if you disagree with her, acknowledge God has given her wisdom in instruction for raising you. Second of all, prioritize her care because life is cyclical. And the one who bore you from weakness to strength while she was still strong, at some point that strength is going to fade and she might need yours. That's what the, the video we watched this morning was all about. When her hands start to become weak, that's when they need our strength. So we give back to them. And then finally, the third one is this. Proverbs gives us a goal to pursue. Turn over to chapter, or stay in chapter 23. It's the next set of verses here. We pay our debt when we leave a godly legacy. So start in verse 22. Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she's old. Buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. The father of, a righteous, of the righteous will greatly rejoice. 
He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. We pay the debt when we leave a godly legacy. When, when we see these verses 22 through 25, we've got to understand them all together. You know, at verse, verse 24 mentions specifically allowing a father to rejoice, that the father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. But in Semitic thought, generally speaking, it's a patriarchal society. If the father is mentioned, the family is implied. And especially when you see the, the mother mentioned, verse 22, it starts this way. Your father gave you life, your mother, uh, don't despise your mother. And then it ends with verse 25 here. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. It's for both of them. It's for both parents to rejoice when we live godly lives. And this is about living for somebody other than ourselves. We don't just live for ourselves. And my hope is that nobody that's listening here today has this selfish perspective where, where I just got to live for myself. I just got to take care of number one. And that we just zero in on our sphere here and we ignore everyone outside of us. It says, let, let them be glad in the way that we are living. We live for Jesus. And Jesus expects us to live for others. And one of the ways that we imply this is considering how our life choices reflect on the ones who've poured into us. You know, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says this. It says, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with patience the race that's set before us. And there he's talking about in a spiritual sense, because we have these people that came before us who le left these godly examples for us. We continue to run our race in light of that. And because of that, and this is what this passage here, verses 22 through 25, are talking about here in Proverbs. This is the idea that's behind it. That those who came and poured into us, those who came before us, would be able to receive gladness from the kind of legacy that they left in us that we carried forward. So how are we living the instruction that we received? If our parents gave us godly instruction, are we living that? Are we walking in righteousness or are we walking in worldliness? And my mom once told me uh, several years ago that she felt blessed that her son had, had followed God's leading and gone into the ministry. Now, I imagine that during the, the decades that came before that, when we were having daily spankings and when we were uh, having revocation of toys and privileges and in the never-ending stream of apologies that I was having to make to Sunday school teachers and to school teachers and to everybody else in my life, when that was going on, I'm sure that my mother would have just been happy if not in jail was where I was at 35 years old. But she says she feels blessed that her son followed after the Lord and went into the ministry. She's told us that she feels blessed that all of her kids, all four of them, are still walking with the Lord. After all those years of wrangling and not killing these four quarreling, ungrateful monsters, that on the far side of that, she could look and say, hey, these kids are still walking with the Lord. Each of them still maintains their faith. She's, she sees that as a blessing from the Lord. Now listen, we're not perfect for sure. Every one of me and my siblings has issues and we married people with issues and then we made people with issues. So there's a lot of issues that are going on here. There's no, nothing perfect about our situation. But from her perspective, God has blessed her through the legacy that we're leaving with, with our children in our lives. And she got to be a part of that. That was a task that God uniquely put on her to train and to instruct us. Those who are mothers now who have children, is this not something that would be a blessing to you that in your old age, as you look back at your kids and your grandkids, you could say they're walking the path that I set them on when they were still small. They're walking in obedience to the Lord. That's, that's a blessing to a mother's heart. Now listen, we, we can't control the choices our kids make. We can't make them honor us. We can't make them listen to us. But what we can do is we can choose to put that example in front of them. And we can choose to honor and leave a legacy for our parents so that our kids can see it and go, I want to pass that on. I want to pass on that good name. I want to pass on that good character. I want to pass on all the things that, that I saw my mom taking from her mom and from her mom's mom. According to, to verse 23, we do this when we hold to the valuable truth that we received. So hold to the valuable truth that we received. Look at verse 23. Buy truth and do not sell it. 
what this, what this means, this is an idiomatic phrase, and it, and it means to grab hold of something and not allow yourself to be moved from it. Grab on to truth. Get truth. Buy it. Give whatever you've got to get in order to find this truth. And then when you have it, don't sell it. Don't give it up. It's encouraging us to pursue righteous, to be that righteous child that brings that parent joy because we grab on to what is true and we hold to it and we never let it go. I don't know, some of, some of you have probably met people in your lives who they, they just sort of waffle back and forth. They, they don't hold on to anything. Truth is what is convenient for that moment. And when somebody says, hey, the truth you're holding on to is putting you on the wrong side of history, they abandon it and they get blown about by the wind. The one who brings joy to their, to their mother is the one who holds unswervingly to the truth, regardless of if it's popular, regardless of if other people like it. It's true. Makes me think of Ephesians 4.14 where Paul talks about growing in knowledge and unity and maturity. And this is what he says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. We can honor the instruction of our parents and we can build a legacy of righteousness by being dedicated to the immovable, unassailable, unassailable truth. And you might say, well, what is this truth? Well, Jesus tells us in John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth for your word is truth. If we want to build a legacy, if we want to carry on the legacy of godly parents or begin a legacy of godly parents for our children, it comes when we grab hold of God's truth in God's word and we live by it and we teach it and we pass it on and we show our kids how important it is. And we don't just take this and leave this in our car from Sunday to Sunday but it becomes a part of our lives. Our kids catch us reading it. Our kids catch us studying it. Our kids catch us praying over it. We hold to the truth, and in that, we honor those who came before us, and we create a legacy for those who came after us. And this, in turn, drives the next part of the verse. Buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Pursue growth with intentionality. That's the second one there. Pursue growth with intentionality. Wisdom, instruction, and understanding in the scriptures are always tied to the fear of the Lord. In fact, if you go back to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, this is what it says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so this is about fostering a God-centered growth built on that truth and by holding a dedication to God's word. We think of that well-known passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, which says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. There's wisdom and there's instruction and there's understanding, and it's all connected to the word. That if we'll hold on to this, we will grow. We will, we will move beyond the simple and we will move into a deeper understanding of the truth and a deeper understanding of God and a deeper dedication to him. And we build up a godly legacy that brings joy to the ones who've raised us by seeking the Lord with all our heart and allowing him to reshape our lives through his word. In essence, we bring joy to our mothers when we walk obedient to the Lord, valuing his ways, valuing his truth and living a life of real meaning. Listen to what John says in 3 John chapter 1, verse 4. It says concerning his spiritual children, we're applying this to physical children. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Listen, as a father, I have no greater joy than in seeing my children grow in godliness. I have no greater joy than seeing my children grab onto the truth that has carried me through so much in life and hold to it and believe in it, and trust it, and live by it. That brings joy to the heart of a godly mother. And so we pursue growth with intentionality. We hold to the valuable truth. And then this third one, it doesn't come from Proverbs, but I want you to turn over to Ezekiel chapter 20. And I want to talk about redeeming their legacy if their legacy was failure. So in Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 18 through 20, 21, this is what it says. 
And I said to their children, that's the children of Israel, in the wilderness, do not walk in the statutes of your fathers, nor keep their rules, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules and keep my Sabbath holy that they may be a sign between you and me, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. But the children rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes and were not careful to obey my rules, by which if a person does them, he shall live. They profaned my Sabbaths. This is a passage I was reading earlier this week, and I was considering teaching on this and preaching on, on this idea here of what happens when the truth and what happens when this legacy is rejected and what happens when, when God's ways are rejected. And I started thinking about this in light of Mother's Day. He says there, don't walk in the statutes of your fathers. Mothers implied there as well, those who came before, or keep their rules or defile yourselves with their idols. He calls the children of Israel to change the course of the family. See, the thing is that there, there have been parents who did an incredibly bad job in raising their kids. There are some here who are listening, and you might say, my parents didn't do a good job. My parents weren't godly people. My parents weren't honorable people. And so Mother's Day is a difficult thing for me because I'm not looking at this great example of a mother who did all these great things. I'm looking at a mother who rejected the truth. I'm looking at a mother who didn't know the truth. I'm looking at a mother who lived an ungodly, unhonorable life. There are a lot of failures because we live in a fallen world. But listen, we can choose to redeem a legacy of failure. By choosing to walk in the Lord's way, to live on the righteous path that they failed to walk. You know why this prophecy is here? You know why this instruction is here? Because he's wanting them to walk on a path that their parents didn't walk on. To restore that family name. To restore what had been lost because of failure. You know, I, I was looking at the genealogy of Jesus this week. And in Jesus' family tree, there's Judah and Tamar who were, who were uh, committed incest, Judah committed incest here. There, there's Rahab the prostitute. There is Ruth, who was the Moabitess, who was a, a foreigner. She's not even a part of the nation of Israel. There's David, who was an adulterous murderer. There, there's dysfunction all through that family history. Even Jesus' own mother was under the suspicion that she was unfaithful to her husband. And yet, despite all of this stuff that goes on in the, the genealogy of Christ, all of that is redeemed through Christ, who through this lineage brought salvation into this world. And the same can be true of us. Not that we bring salvation, but that we, we redeem the name of our family. There's a family that I was thinking about this week who in years past were known for being wild. They were known for being addicts for being troublemakers, and there were generational sins piled upon generational sins going back several generations here. But anybody who was to meet this family now in the present, they have no knowledge of all the baggage that came. All they know is the faithfulness of a generation that chose to break those patterns and redeem that name, and now that family name is honorable. And now when people hear that family name, they don't think about all these generational sins. They think about the faithfulness of the generation that they know. We can restore honor. We can restore a name. And through forgiveness of failures and dedication to the Lord, posthumously give honor to those who came before us when we walk in obedience. Listen, every one of us has a debt that comes from motherhood, and we owe it to them to live in light of this. We, we owe it to the ones that are still with us, and we owe it to the ones who have passed on before us, we honor them by seeking to walk in obedience to the Lord. They've given us so much that on Mother's Day we want to honor them and give something back, not just flowers or dinner. Listen, if, if today you have not given flowers or dinner or something, you should probably do that, but not just that. To give obedience and respect and dedication and instruction to to pursue godliness so that they see the fruit paying off. Like that's how we want to honor our mothers. We want them to see that their labors and their investment have made a difference in our lives and that we are different because of what they have done for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord God, I pray that every one of us 
would be dedicated to, to honoring the ones that you've given to us. Lord, that, that every one of us would be dedicated to living a life of happiness for you and for your glory, but also as a way to, to honor those who have come before us. Lord God, even if we didn't have godly parents, we want to begin a legacy that brings honor to the, the names that we have been given. Lord, we want, to, we want to live lives in such a way that when people hear our name or they hear our family name, they don't think about dysfunction, but they think about honor and they think about righteousness and they think about godliness. Lord God, I pray that everybody that has listened today, everybody that, that's been a part of this service would just want to bring joy and honor to their parents, to their mother. Lord, to, to give them that as a gift this Mother's Day. Lord, we thank you for, for everything that you've done. Lord, we know that it's, it's because of the new life that you've given us and it's because of the new life that you've poured into us that we can actually live this way. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can actually live this way and bring honor to those who have invested in us. And so, Lord God, that's our prayer this morning, that because of, of the new life we have in you, because of the Holy Spirit that lives in us, that we would be a people of honor and dedication to those who came before us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for being with us today. I want to thank you for joining us here. Again, happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers. 
Um, we end our service always by taking an offering. Obviously, we can't do that now. And so if you're someone who is still giving during the quarantine time or wants to give, you can go to www.kernvillechurch.com, go to the giving tab, and we have an online giving portal there. And uh, you can also either mail checks to the church at uh, P.O. Box 403, Kernville 93238, or drop them off here in the office. And if you want to continue worshiping and honoring the Lord in that way, uh, those are some opportunities for you to do that. Hey, we're glad that you're here with us again. As I say, every Sunday we miss you. Uh, we're glad that you have chosen to worship with us. We can't wait for the time where I'm not just looking at your photos out here, but rather uh, I'm looking at your faces here. So have a great Sunday. Happy Mother's Day. And uh, may the Lord bless and keep you.